Okay, today we are at Lulworth Cove. We brought a lovely picnic, and I should be using this basket for a bit of coastal foraging, hopefully, on the way back. But let me just show you Lulworth Cove. We are by far not the only people to have had the idea of coming to Lulworth Cove today. It's actually quite busy. It's bank holiday, uh, Good Friday, and it's a beautiful spring day. And why wouldn't you want to come to a lovely place like this today? So this is Lulworth Cove. It is, I think, well, in my opinion, the most beautiful natural cove on the south coast. Really, a pirate ship would not go amiss right there. This looks like a rather nice little spot for a picnic, just here amongst the Alexanders. Yeah, I think so. And a lovely little spot overlooking, isn't it beautiful? Chalk cliffs with limestone underlying. So the beach is kind of shingle and limestone blocks. Lots of opportunities down there for rock pooling and crab hunting and whatnot. Really beautiful. See these little outcroppings of limestone here on the beach? This is the remains of what used to be the cliff. And the cliff's quite interesting. I'm not going to get too close because bits of it fall off. But you can see that the strata in the limestone are vertical here because of the way that it's been folded by geologic forces. And embedded in amongst all of this chalk and limestone is always flint nodules. And the flint nodules are the more durable things, so that's what ends up making up the beach. The limestone wears away in the surf. There's a piece of limestone there. Wearing away actually partly because those holes in there are drilled by shellfish, boring pivots. So the limestone eventually goes away, just leaving the flint cobbles. So we're at the other end of the cove now, and this is quite interesting up here. Actually, I'm just going to show you what's happening up here. Because we're at the end of this sort of cliff and there must have been a water course here at some point because you've got all these clays, all these different clays here, which are quite interesting and quite colourful, aren't they? Iron rich, I would say, some of these. Certainly that red coloration there is almost certainly iron. And all the way around here, actually, so we'll have a little wander around here. Obviously this cliff bit here is collapsing, but this is a kind of clay layer. This might have been topsoil off the top of the cliff of course. But yeah we can see more of iron red coming out the soil here. And this up here if I'm not mistaken is sea beet. So there's a wild edible. There's rock samphire, another wild edible. That one over there that's another sea beet there. This is an interesting bit of formation here actually it's like a grit stone. But also Here's a sea beet here, and you can see the thickened roots. So you can see how this is kind of related to beetroot and sugar beets and things. These are the thickened starchy or sugary roots that the beet plant uses to store its winter food. A little bit further on, we've got, this is actually just iron ore. So this, st this stone here is iron ore. This is very similar to the stuff I smelted to make that play button or attempted to melt to make that play button and you can see how it's formed with the cobbles the flints embedded in it so these are the bits that are weathering out these flints and forming the beach and you get these cobbles in the chalk layers and the limestone layers as well but yeah you can see there must be a lot of iron in the soil here because it's all leaching out just there
So just going to head up to the viewpoint up there above the cove. Feeling a little bit out of breath. So we'll have a look from that viewpoint up there, but then over there to the west, there's Durdle Door and Stair Hole. We're not going to go as far as Durdle Door today because that's quite a trek, but we're going to, we'll do that another day in a different video. But I think we will go and have a look at Stair Hole. A couple of brave souls out there wild swimming, how about that? So down here you can really see the kind of tilted strata of the limestone. We'll get a better look at that though in just a moment. You can, you'll be able to see in a moment just how that's been folded and tilted. It's a long way down. So then don't worry, I'm quite safe here. The red flag over there, if you can see it, indicates that the Lulworth artillery range might be firing today. So walking across the cliffs over that way, there are parts where you can't go if they're using the ranges. I believe that's what that red flag is for. Down there is Stair Hole, that hole in the rock. We'll have a better look at it from over there. You can see though, again, we've got the iron clay coming out the cliff there. But this big slab of limestone is obviously a flat piece of limestone that was once horizontal. And it's tilted and that's why it stayed together like that. And then the sea has kind of punched through it. So it's a limestone arch. Not as impressive as Durdle Door. Well, it depends what you like, I suppose, doesn't it? You know, it depends what you're into. And there over there, you can see just how there's a kind of horseshoe shaped curvature to it over there. I'll do a still frame and we'll highlight it on the camera. You can't really see it as well as I can in reality, but it's just been folded like a napkin. So yeah, this path here, we could follow this and trek over the hill there towards Sturdle Door. I'm not going to do that today. It's just a bit too far. This plant here we've looked at before. Oh, actually it smells really nice. It's like a honey aroma coming off of this. This is Alexander's edible wild plant. I did intend to pick some today, but do you know what? I think I might not. I think I might do that another time. It's a, I've left it a little bit late. And although there's still some edible stuff here, these stems are edible. I don't know. I'll see. I'll see how I feel on the way back. Oh, we've still got a little bit of coffee left. This looks like a lovely little place just to sit down on this little hummock here and just watch the waves. So that's pretty much our trip to Lulworth Cove. Quite busy today, but you can't blame people for wanting to come out on such a lovely day. It's a very popular destination. Obviously it's school holidays as well. I think I am going to pick some Alexanders from this patch here where it's very abundant and I won't uh, even leave a mark by picking a basket full from here. So let's go and have a look. Just go in a little bit so we're not looking at the windswept bits. And yeah, I'm just going to pick some nice, fresh, youngish tops like that. Just going to go for like maybe that much. And it's the stems and the flowers that I'm most interested in. You can see how this is related to celery. The leaves are very similar to celery. It's in the same family as celery and carrots. It's in the same family as hemlock water dropwort. So it does look kind of similar to that, but the stems are not hollow. Right, so here's my haul of Alexander's. And obviously it's gonna need a little bit of a wash. But yeah, to just allay any concerns about uh, hemlock water drop work, the leaves are very much bigger and lobed and less parsley-like. So there's no chance of me having made a fatal mistake here. This is definitely Alexander's greenish sort of uh, little, almost like cauliflower-like flower buds here. These flower buds are edible. Stems, apart from the really big ones, they do get hollow when the stems are big but the thinner stems are completely solid. So, what is Alexander's actually like? Well, let's have a little taste. 
Actually, what I can do here, I'm just going to test. Yeah, it's just ever so slightly fibrous at this point. So what I may end up doing is peeling it like this and just using the inside part, just like celery does really. Celery goes a bit fibrous when it's a bit older. And of course this is related to celery. So there we go, that's a mostly peeled Alexander stem there. Oh, Eva. So, aroma, strong celery, carroty, parsley sort of aroma, taste. Sweet. Carrots, strong carrots. Slight bitterness, slight fruity floral. I almost want to say soapy, but not soapy, not soapy like soap, scented. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to peel a bunch of these stems and then I think we'll pickle it. Now, when I've cooked this in the past, I thought I could detect almost like an aniseed or licorice aroma to it. So maybe that will come out of it as well. They're really nice, closed, tight buds there. I've just cut those out. Those go straight in the bowl. The flower heads, if they're not too far gone, I'll chop them off and have them as well. And then the stems, it's just a case of this outer bit here. If I'd got there a bit earlier in the year, these stems probably wouldn't have so much fibrous material on the outside of them like this. But the stems, I'm just gonna cut. And what you can do is then snap them and any remaining stringy bits just come straight off. So yeah, anything that's stringy is gonna go on the compost. And then hopefully we'll end up with a really nice crisp pickle. I don't know if I actually said this is my intention. What I'm doing is gonna, I'm gonna lacto-ferment these and make a crunchy wild herb pickle. I need something else to go in here that's not just Alexander's. So we'll go out and have a look for that in a minute. We are back at Shrimp Cottage at the moment. We'll go out in a minute and see if we can find something else to go in this pickle. I am gonna give this a rinse before we pickle it. I'm not gonna scrub it and sterilize it because the whole point of lacto-fermented pickles is you need to introduce some microorganisms. So you actually have to have some bugs and beasties attached to the leaves. It's almost unavoidable to do that anyway, so we don't need to worry, but if I was to try to sanitize these or something, stupid idea that would be, it wouldn't ferment, it wouldn't pickle because the pickling process is caused by acid secreting and acid loving bacteria. And so what will happen is we'll put some salt water on this. We'll leave nature to do its thing. And the populations of harmful bacteria to start with, all sorts of things will flourish in there, including things that would make me quite sick. See, there's some seeds. I don't know what those are like. Let's have a little taste. Ooh, interesting potential as a spice there. Well, I think we might just have those in there. They are tender, so in they go. So yeah, initially, when it starts fermenting, all kinds of microorganisms, including some that would make me quite ill, were I to ingest them in any kind of dose. So it's not a good idea to do a kind of quick process of lacto-fermentation, but over time, as the pH goes down and it becomes more and more acidic, eventually that becomes hostile to all the pathogens and beneficial to the lactobacilli and the, the kind of gut beneficial bacteria. And so it becomes safe to eat by pretty much its own accord. Now, I have an interesting theory, well, I think it's interesting, about lacto-fermentation, about how the pickling process was discovered for lacto-fermentation. What you have to do for this is immerse the vegetables in salt water. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the concentration of salt you need to use is quite close to seawater. It's about kind of 2%, 3% by weight of, well, some people do it by total weight of the pickle. Some people do it by weight of just the water, but two or three or 4% of salt in the solution. That sounds like seawater, doesn't it? And I don't think that's a coincidence. My pet, I don't know if you'd call it a theory, my pet hypothesis is that one way that lacto-fermenting 
pickles might have been discovered is, well, if you imagine some sort of Neolithic forager going down to the coast to fish maybe, or to pick shellfish, and also picking some wild vegetables, because actually a lot of the plants that grow on the coast, there's, it's actually a, a lot of our vegetables, like sea beet, the ancestors of some of our cabbage varieties, and so on, come from coastal regions, as well as herbs. Herbs like thyme and marjoram are often found on coastal headlands. Anyway, so one day, some Neolithic forager was down gathering wild vegetables and decided to rinse them off in the sea and perhaps packed them into a, a clay pot or something like that to carry them home and maybe top that clay pot off with seawater because they didn't necessarily have dried salt and so for seasoning they may well if they live by the sea have just used seawater anyway so neolithic forager person carries that jar home and for one reason or another it gets covered up and forgotten about for a week or two and then when it's discovered the vegetables that were in the jar have preserved themselves and maybe the sour flavour might have been something to be a bit reluctant about at first. Maybe they might have not wanted to taste those at first, but, you know, if they had other reasons why food was scarce and, you know, they couldn't go out foraging, weather, illness, whatever, they might well have decided, oh, well, I'd better just eat this stuff that I've got and then discovered that it's really delicious. So anyway, I think that's one way that lacto-fermented pickles could well have just been accidentally discovered because it seems like too much of a coincidence that the target salinity that you need for making this work is so very close to seawater. Now, of course, it's probably true that things like lacto-fermentation have been discovered or invented over and over and over again in different parts of the world at different times by different people, which only makes it more likely that my little story is true somewhere. All right, so that's the yield from that basket of Alexander's. And I'm just gonna snap up some of these stems, the longer pieces. These are the pieces I put in there first before I figured out that a good way of getting rid of the stringy is by snapping them and allowing the stringy bits to reveal themselves. So I'll just go through that and make sure I've got them all. Make sure all of these pieces are going to snap. I want them shorter anyway. That's the yield from that basket of Alexander's. That's going to be the basis of my pickle. But there's not enough here to fill my pickling jar. And anyway, it'd be a bit monotonous if it's just one thing in there, won't it? So I'm going to go out and pick something else now. What I'd really like to do is find some ramsons some wild garlic, but I haven't yet found a good location for that near to where I live here in Dorset now. I did see some three-cornered leeks in the car park at Lulworth, and I was thinking about picking some, but that was really the wrong place to pick them. They were horribly dirty and dusty and obviously covered in traffic fumes from the car park. And also, I'm really wary about bringing three-cornered leeks back to this garden. So a little rinse in cold water, just tap water. Some people use spring water for this process. Uh, certainly for the pickling process I will use spring water, but for the washing most of this is going to drain off. Unless you've got really pungently chlorinated tap water, it's fine just to use it for the rinse. So here's my pickling vessel, it's just a big kilner jar, and I've zeroed the scale so that I can just weigh these Alexanders in. Right, so we've got 330 grams of Alexanders. I went out with the intention of picking some crow garlic to add to this lacto-ferment. The crow garlic is a little bit too far gone. I suppose it's just a bit warmer down here in Dorset than it was in Hampshire where we used to live. And the crow garlic is further on and the plants were just a little bit wiry and dry. So, didn't come home empty handed though. I did find a patch of three cornered leek. Now, <laughs> I went to pick some of this and Jenny said, don't you dare. <laughs> um, and she's right. We had this in the garden at the old house. We accidentally got this in the garden at the old house. I think it hitchhiked in on a plant we bought at a nursery or something like that, or somebody gave us. 
and it, it was an incredibly invasive plant. It took over the whole garden, which might sound wonderful, you know, free onions, except they, it smothered everything in the garden, so it was horrible. We haven't got it here at Shrimp Cottage, and I don't want it here at Shrimp Cottage, so I was really careful not to pick the bulbs, and I'm gonna be really careful not to even drop any of the trimmings in here in case there's a seed attached, or, you know, I mean, there are some flowers here, but they're not set seed yet. But all of this is either going to go in the pickle or it's going to go in the municipal compost, which is taken away and digested at a high temperature to make biogas. I also picked some dandelion flowers. My three cornered leeks have had a little rinse. We've got all the dirt off of them. Well, most of it. There's a not very nice piece. I'm going to cut these into like just over a centimetre chunks. and then we'll add them into the jar and I'll weigh them as I go. And as I say, you might think I'm being kind of paranoid with this plant, but it's uh, it's with good reason. We had such a bad time with it at the old place. It kind of ruined the garden. But also, it's such a devious plant. It recruits ants to move its seeds around. And even when I just picked a bunch of this, I just grabbed a bunch of it and I cut it so that I wouldn't end up getting the bulbs. Just the action of cutting it uprooted one of the plants because it produces these little bell bills that are kind of offsets of the main plant. And they're very, very loosely attached. And sometimes they're on top of the sort of main growing mass of the plant. And so even when I went to just cut some of this without pulling the bulbs, I accidentally pulled the bulb and I nearly brought it back here. Obviously, I'd have noticed that in the basket, but I'm not taking any chances. I mean, just to let you know what it was actually like. So when we actually accidentally introduced this into the old garden, it was one of those things where I didn't know what it was at first. And so the first year we saw it, there was just one little clump of it. And I saw the flowers and I thought, oh, that's a pretty plant. And then the next spring, it was just everywhere in the garden. It wasn't overgrowing at that point, but it was everywhere. And the following spring, it was everywhere in massive clumps. Dandelion flowers always look a little bit sad once they've been picked. They close up really quickly and they look really a bit draggled once they've had a little rinse. I'm going to cut them in half lengthways otherwise we won't see the inside. So now we know we've got enough vegetable matter to fill this jar. What I'm actually going to do is I've got some spring water here, some bottled water. It's best to use bottled water for this because, again, if your tap water's got chlorine in it, that will interfere with the action of the fermentation. Or at least that's what everybody says. It, I think it depends how much chlorine there is in your water. Okay, so I haven't put any salt in here yet. Do you know what I should have done? Is just weighed the jar first and then subtracted everything else. Subtracted the total. So that's how much liquid we're going to have in there. All of that, which is my vegetables and water, weighs one kilo, 882 grams. 2% 2 of that is 37.62 grams. I could add 37.62 grams of salt to this. I might go to 40 because anywhere between two and 5% is okay. So I might go to like 40 or 45 grams of salt just to make sure that we get a good ferment. Okay, that was way too much messing around. It's got to be an easier way to do that, but I really made it very much more complicated than it needs to be, I'm sure. What we've ended up knowing is this is the right amount of vegetables to fill this jar. This is the right amount of water to cover these vegetables. And we know the total weight of the vegetables plus the water. And we know that 2% of that weight is this much salt. So this is 37.62 grams of salt. Actually, I rounded it up to 40. So now... And we'll dissolve the salt in the water. And this salt water now goes into the jar. That lot now needs to be pressed down to drive out any air bubbles that might be lurking down the bottom there. And let those things steep in the brine a little bit overnight. And then in the morning, I'll probably take some of this liquid out so I can put a weight in the top here. One thing I almost forgot to do is let's test the acidity of this. It should be at this point not very acidic. 
So yeah, at present, somewhere around pH 7, which is neutral. And so what we should find, assuming this does ferment okay, is when we check back in on it in a couple of weeks, it should have gone quite acidic, maybe down to like pH 3. As this has stood overnight, a layer of clear brine has appeared at the bottom. That means probably that the salt has drawn out some of the moisture from these vegetables and compacted them down a bit, which is fine, and they floated up. That does mean I can put some more vegetables in here now. So I've been out this morning and picked some hogweed shoots. So we're going to add those in for just a bit more variety of texture and flavour in here. So hogweed shoots, not giant hogweed, obviously. If you don't know the difference, don't pick hogweed. But I'm going to chop these into fairly large pieces because that will actually help me in compressing down the vegetables. So I'm going to cut these into it's about two centimetre chunks. And you can see there's not a lot of space in the top here. If I just press these hogweed pieces in here, that's probably going to cause the brine to overflow. So I'm going to take some of the brine out just momentarily. Turkey baster is useful for that. Now the other thing that's probably happened here is that the vegetables have floated up because of gases from fermentation that's already started. So we need to press these down to keep them under the surface of the liquid. And I've got an idea on how to do that. But anyway, first we'll just take out some of this brine. There's still plenty there. I can still see a clear layer down the bottom. Hogweed bits are gonna go in. Now we can mix it all up later when we decant it into jars after it's finished fermentation. But these hogweed bits are gonna serve a useful purpose for me because the other stuff I chopped up and it had lots of little bits in it which were floating up. This hogweed layer on top will keep most of that down. Now what I've done in the past to weigh this down is put a bag in there, a plastic bag, and then fill that bag with water from the neck so the weight of the water is pressing it down. In fact, I fill it with brine at the same concentration as the liquid here, and then if it leaks, it's not the end of the world. But I discovered one of these Dow Egbert's coffee lids fits rather neatly through the neck of that jar, and I think that's probably going to be enough just to keep those things submerged. So that's what we're going with. Okay, now all we need to do now is wait. So I'm just gonna put this here. And keep an eye on it. The bowl is just in case this bubbles over and leaks. The bag is just held in place with a rubber band. That's just to stop things like fruit flies getting in there and getting into the mix. I will just have a, a look at this every couple of days just to make sure there's no mold forming on the top. And if there is, I'll skim it off. Mold isn't a big problem with these sorts of pickles, as long as the main pickle is getting quite acidic. Sometimes you get a little bit of mold and yeast at the surface where there's boundary conditions, and just skimming that off is usually sufficient, unless the whole thing goes really bad, but it hopefully won't do that. Right, we're on day three of pickling these wild vegetables. I picked them on Friday, it is now Monday, so it's kind of the third day. And this is already starting to work. There are several ways I can tell. One is that the vegetation has floated up again, but it's floated up for a different reason this time. I'll just carefully extract that glass lid out the top, which is my weight. And this vegetation has floated up because watch what happens when I press it down. Can you see bubbles of gas rising there? Those are the products of fermentation. That's CO2 from the bacteria that are fermenting these vegetables. And so there's gas being produced in there. There is also a slightly sort of pickly smell coming off of this, a slightly sharp, acidic sort of vinegary smell coming off of this. Not vinegar, it's lactic acid. So I think it might be interesting to do another test with the indicator paper. Now obviously I don't know that this indicator paper is food safe, so I'm not going to dip it straight in there. It probably is fine, but what I'll do instead is just get a little bit on a spoon and we'll get that in there. Well, I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but we are now on pH 6. Before, when we tested it, when we put, put it straight in there, we were on seven, but that is now definitely nearer to that golden yellow color than it was when we put it in. So the pH has dropped a little bit. It is actually turning a little bit acidic. Now, of course, another way to test that would be to taste it, but that's probably not a great idea right now because at the moment, the organisms that live in there at the moment might not all be all that beneficial to human gut function. 
at the moment, there's going to be quite a diversity of different microorganisms all in there competing for resources. The brine, that is the salt we've added to this, unbalances that competition in favour of the acid forming bacteria that we want, the lactobacilli and the other things like that. Anyway, so just going to cover that back up with the bag that I'm using as an airlock and to keep flies out. We'll put that back on the shelf and leave it for another few days. A whole week has passed since I started this pickle, so let's have a look at it now. Just going to take that jar lid out of there that's acting as a, a weight. Several changes have occurred. One is that the coloration of everything has kind of gone a little bit more cooked looking. It's not cooked, obviously it's just pickling itself, but uh, the action of the acids in here will be having a similar effect to cooking. I'm going to have a sniff. Definitely smelling quite fermented now. And the material has all floated up again, so I'm gonna, I am going to push it back down. And we can see at the bottom of the jar, well, there's loads of gas coming up again, which is a good sign. Those are gases from fermentation. But the liquid has gone cloudy. And that cloudiness is partly the populations of bacteria that are now fermenting this pickle. It's all looking very healthy, but we're going to do another pH test now. So this is after a week. Yeah. So now we're down to pH four, maybe three, maybe three and a half. So really quite acidic now. So that's definitely working. I'm going to leave it another couple of weeks anyway, before I actually taste any of this, but that's definitely pickling away quite merrily. I'm going to end the video now because always a bit of a quandary as to whether to make these videos to save this all up and publish it when I taste this pickle or whether I publish it now. So I'm going to end the video now because I want to publish this while the vegetables I've used here, which is three cornered leeks and Alexander's are still pickable and fresh in perhaps slightly more northern parts of the UK than me here on the south coast. So I want to publish this and give you a chance to, if you want to go out and pick Alexander's and make your own pickles, to do that. So that is the start of my lacto-fermented pickle. We will be revisiting this when it's ready to taste, and that's going to be a few weeks from now. So I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.